I wanted to thank you all for coming today. Uh, I have the pleasure of uh, introducing our welcoming speaker this morning. Uh, we have someone who has been an advocate for uh, energy efficiency and weatherization, uh, energy, uh, renewable energy and environmental issues all together. Uh, he was the chief of staff uh, for us over at CEQ and now is the director of the White House Office of Public Engagement. So I hope you'll help me join, join me in uh, welcoming John Carson. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the White House. Uh, welcome to everyone who is uh, watching us uh, live today on live stream. I want to kick today's discussion on weatherization by thanking each and every one of you here today who have been part of making history together. We together, the federal government, those of you in the supply chain, those of you at the front line in every one of those homes, together we weatherized over one million homes. So thank you. We, um, now, for those of you following along uh, today, or those of you who brought your Blackberries or iPhones with you, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this, but we want to be tweeting all day long, we want to be blogging all day long, we want to use today's event to get as many people as excited about weatherization and what we got done together as those of you in the room today. If you uh, know what a hashtag is, and if you don't, you should figure it out, uh, we're going to be using the hashtag WXWH, weatherization in the White House, hashtag WXWH. Um, I will be tweeting a little bit later. And that's really the main ask that I have for each and every one of you. This story of what we got done together and of the jobs that have been created and the jobs and the companies that have been launched because of this effort, this story needs to be told. And if we've learned anything, it's that you can't tell these stories at the macroeconomic level. When we talk about infrastructure, we don't talk about treasury bonds and investments. We talk about the bridge over Highway 14 that needs to get rebuilt and the construction companies that need to be put back to work. And when we talk about weatherization and energy efficiency and what it has done to communities across the country, you all here today are the stories that we need to lift up. The companies that were a part of getting those one million homes weatherized, the companies that are still involved in energy efficiency and creating jobs today. You can't tell this story at the national level. You need to tell it each home at a time, each electricity bill that is cheaper than it was two years ago, each company involved in the supply chain that's making a difference. And that is the ask that I want to kick today off with. If you are on Twitter, tweet about it. If you've got a blog, blog about it. If all you've got is a bulletin board that you can pin something up and make sure everyone in each of your organizations, everyone in each of your companies feels as much a part of this as, um, as those homeowners who are benefiting from the work that we got done together. This, th thousands of people were involved in this effort and thousands of people are now part of this effort that's been launched out of what we got done together. And that's our ask of you today, that you help tell this story and that from this White House event today, um, an issue that we care so deeply about, as well as all of you, you help us spread the word. I want to give a uh, quick thanks to the National Association for State and Community Service Programs and Advocates for Other America, who are just a huge help in pulling this together. Tim Warfield, Alice Galston, uh, Brad Penny, and Arlie Johnson. Could you all quick stand up? And We so much appreciate the work you did to pull this all together, and we appreciate everyone's time today. But as I said, throughout the day when you get that moment to help spread the word, and when you go back home, and if it's just finding three people in the grocery store this weekend to tell the story of what we got done together, please do it. And to kick things off today, what's so exciting about this for those of us in the White House, in the administration, who've been working on this issue, is I think when we were in those very long meetings about what was going to be in the Recovery Act, when we were in those interminable meetings about how to execute the Recovery Act, and you all remember those moments we were talking about, I think we all had a picture in our, in our heads of a day like today when we would get to sit down with and have a conversation with the people who were on the front lines who made this happen, and the people who I think most importantly are realizing what we all hoped would be the outcome of this, that it wouldn't just be one program, that long-term economic development and jobs would, and energy savings would be created all across the country. And so 
It's with great pleasure that I get to introduce the person who was spending those longest hours here at the White House, the person who was an advocate long for these issues before they were um, as broad as they are now, someone who had all of you in mind as we were fighting to make this a reality, uh, the President's Chief uh, Energy um, uh, Advisor, Heather Zeichel. Thank you, and thanks for the opportunity to join you this morning. I thought I'd start uh, the morning out by giving you a bit of a bird's eye view of the administration's energy and climate policies. Shortly after the president took office, we unveiled an all of the above energy approach. We said, let's develop more natural gas and oil, but let's also double down on our opportunities to improve energy efficiency, uh, to, to invest in renewables, and to make sure that we're producing more solar and wind power and other clean sources of energy. Since then, our dependence on foreign oil has gone down every year the president has been in office. In fact, over the last year alone, we've reduced net imports by one million barrels a day. The United States is now producing more domestic oil than at any time in the last eight years. But we're all producing, also producing more natural gas and biofuels than at any time in our history. And since 2008, America has doubled the use of renewable energy like solar power and wind power. But I mostly want to highlight the administration's work around energy efficiency because this has been an important part of the president's overall agenda. From our perspective, improving energy efficiency, whether it's in the transportation sector or the built environment, is truly the fastest, cheapest, and easiest way to decrease our dependence on oil, reduce pollution, and save families and businesses money on their energy bills. One of the very first actions that the president took when he came into office was to direct the Environmental Protection Agency and the Department of Transportation to work with the auto industry and develop new fuel economy standards for cars and trucks. That was an important step for two reasons. First, the vast majority of the oil we use today, close to 70%, is in the transportation sector. Second, at the time, fuel economy standards had not been changed for more than 30 years. But with the president's leadership, we were able to move forward. Taken together, the standards we propose span models 2011 to 2025 and represent the toughest standards in history. Under our final program, average fuel efficiency for cars and trucks is, expedite, is, is expected to nearly double, reaching an average performance equivalent of about 55 miles per gallon by 2025. Beyond the transportation sector, these, this administration has taken action to improve efficiency in the built environment. Since October of 2009, DOE, the, uh, the, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, have jointly, as John Carson said, completed energy upgrades in more than one million homes across the country. For many families, these upgrades save over $400 on their heating and cooling bills in the first year alone. That program, as everybody in this room knows, has also been a very successful job creator. To complement those efforts, the administration has also taken new steps to help families save money by increasing the efficiency of everyday appliances, like refrigerators and dishwashers. Under this administration, the Department of Energy has finalized new standards for more than 30 products, which are estimated to save consumers more than $300 billion through 2030. And as many of you know, through programs like the President's Better Buildings Challenge, we're focused on how we can work across sectors to make commercial buildings 20% more efficient by 2020. Achieving that goal could save businesses more than, more than $40 billion a year on energy costs and create new jobs along the way. On the jobs front, we were very excited to announce just yesterday that the administration is taking new steps to support training programs for Americans working in building operations. The Department of Energy and the Department of Commerce have selected three centers for building operations excellence. These centers will be eligible for up to $1.3 million to develop worker training programs focused on building retuning, energy management, and building operations. In the coming weeks and months, we'll, move, we'll keep moving forward. We'll be focused on finalizing the next round of the historic fuel economy standards for cars and trucks, building out new initiatives around energy efficiency in the industrial sector, and continuing the successful programs like the Better Buildings Challenge and the Administration's Green Button Initiative. And where there are opportunities to bring down barriers that remain in the way of greater efficiency, whether it's with or without Congress, we'll continue to act. The bottom line is that the President believes very strongly that energy efficiency is one of the best opportunities to enhance our energy security, create new jobs, and make our economy stronger. 
Uh, I just want to again echo uh, John Carson's words of thanks for all of the support that you have given the administration. Everybody in this room is evidence of the benefits of the clean energy economy, and it's truly been an honor to work with many of the people in this room. We look forward to continuing that work into the future. And with that, I'm going to introduce uh, your next speaker, um, the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Energy Efficiency, Kathleen Hogan. Uh, all the successes that we mentioned here in the energy efficiency space uh, lead directly to, to uh, Kathleen Hogan's front door. Uh, she's been an amazing advocate not only in um, this position at DOE, uh, but has a long, long history of supporting um, innovative programs that will help build the clean energy economy. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Kathleen. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to say a few words as our uh, panel comes up and joins me here. So uh, thank you for that uh, very nice introduction. I'm pleased to be here as well to help celebrate uh, this important program and this important uh, point in time. I think what our panel is going to show is really how valuable energy efficiency is to the country, uh, and the low in to, particularly with the low-income community uh, and really beyond. We've, we've heard the numbers, uh, a million homes weatherized hundreds of dollars of savings for each family uh, in each one of those homes. Uh, but we also know the program has done more than that. It has supported tens of thousands of direct jobs. It's helped build a trained workforce that can participate in a growing home improvement marketplace. And it has truly led to the development of many tools and procedures now used in these programs across the country. And you can look at those contributions, and, and they're pretty tangible, important uh, contributions, but, but the value and the power of the weatherization program is really even broader than that. Uh, due to the materials and equipment that go into these homes. And I think that's really part of the broader power of energy efficiency, both the direct jobs as well as um, the vast other aspects uh, through the supply chain that help our economy grow. And we're going to do um, in this panel a bit of a deep dive um, into the weatherization program. But for a moment, I just want to echo a couple of the things that um, Heather Zeichel mentioned because of the great power of energy efficiency and some of the other things that we are doing to tap into this. Um, we really are doing, and that is why uh, the president is um, backing the Better Buildings Challenge, as an example, to spur investments in our commercial and industrial sectors. Uh, and we have a great set of leaders that have come forth to help us uh, drive those improvements as well. Uh, and then just this week, we announced um, Starbucks and Staples uh, joining in that effort. And the federal government is here to do its part as well. The president challenged the federal government to drive over $2 billion of investment over the next two years um, through performance-based contracting. And the federal government is stepping up to meet that challenge. Uh, and then back at the Department of Energy, we, of course, keep doing things uh, in partnership uh, with the community uh, to, so we can keep doing things better. So we're inventing sort of new mile per gallon ratings for homes so people can better understand the efficiency of their homes and the things they can do to improve them, uh, and as well as the new Green Button Initiative that can pull forth uh, the data that we need that underlies um, so much of what we want to understand about our homes and our opportunities for improvement. So with that, um, Let's uh, dive into the weatherization program and some of these supply chain issues. I'm going to introduce the panel members um, quickly, uh, and then we'll, they'll each have uh, about eight minutes uh, to tell us uh, their aspect, um, their good story. So first we have uh, Annette Odrin. Uh, she's a sales consultant uh, for Advocates for the Other America, a nonprofit dedicated to championing causes for low-income Americans uh, in Washington, D.C. Next is Chris Hoke. He's the president and owner of National Fiber uh, since 1997, during which time he's established cellulose as the uh, only local green affordable high performance uh, insulation in the Northeast. Uh, next is Benito Hernandez, the co-founder of BNS Company, a residential retrofit and construction company uh, that's been working in the residential housing industry since uh, the late 80s. And then next is Rod Williams. Uh, he's a founder and owner of Energy Specialists, Inc. Um, in Alaska, Energy Savers, Inc. in Washington State, and Energy Savers, Inc. in Oregon. So we look forward uh, to hearing uh, from each of you. And uh, we will start uh, with Annette. All righty. 
Uh, good morning, and thank you for being here. Let's see if I can point this at my face. I'm about a foot shorter than some of these guys. Uh, why WAP? Uh, the rest of the good folks who came from across the country to speak today will answer different parts of that question. I want to make sure we cover one that isn't mentioned often enough when we're discussing uh, weatherization. And that's something that was mentioned earlier by these folks, but it kind of gets lost uh, a lot of the time. It's our, natural depe our national dependence on outside sources of energy. Um, our dependence on foreign oil, which can be withheld or interrupted, is a, a national security issue. U.S. borrowing to purchase approximately 40 to 50 percent of the oil we use adversely affects our economy and contributes to our deficit. Uh, saving these monies, the interest payments that follow, and the uncertainties of being dependent on others for such a crucial need makes energy, as we probably already know, the, energy, the national security issue of our time. Although they have different opinions on what's desirable, both parties agree that developing new sources of energy is crucial. But developing those new supplies, while extremely important, is expensive. Decreasing the amount that we waste thereby freeing up domestic energy to replace the foreign oil is key to strengthening our nation's energy, nation's energy security. And energy conservation is by far the least expensive new source that we could have. Now, of course, and we talked about this uh, when we were discussing writing this whole thing, uh, oil is not the only form of energy which is conserved through we weatherization projects. Okay, well, fund funding weatherization increases our energy independence through a variety of practical measures. Weatherization crews tighten the building shell and add insulation to lower heating and cooling demands. They install more efficient appliances, such as heating and cooling systems, water heaters, or light bulbs that use less energy to do the same job. Since residences account for approximately 20% of our domestic energy use, it becomes clear that work done by this network positively affects our national economy. The folks on our first panel represent the hardworking people at hundreds of companies, large and small, across the United States, whose daily work supports the weatherization assistance program. Collectively, members of the WAP supply chain make the products and provide the services the network needs to function. Everything from software to testing equipment, insulation to installation machines, furnaces and water heaters, windows to training to call. While most of these companies also sell both to the WAP agencies and private contractors. Weatherization is an important part of their customer base. Cuts to weatherization funding mean jobs are lost, not only at every weatherization organization, but also at every WAP support company. And these American companies provide products and services from the start of the application process all the way to the final punch list. Self software developers, and I see some in the audience here, um, software developers uh, streamline the job of determining eligibility, tracking, and reporting projects. Initial inspections are done by specially trained and experienced crew leaders. They bring U.S. made equipment to test for everything from potentially life-threatening health and safety issues like the presence of carbon monoxide and combustion gases in the air and gas leaks from both combustion appliances and, oh, heavens, building performance issues, comfort issues like the envelope and ductwork leakage. When the rehab work begins, crews arrive well trained, thanks to the extensive WAP training center network. Um, dense packed insulation like cellulose manufactured by National Fiber, um, represented here by Chris Oak from Belchertown, Massachusetts, I love that name, I had to put that name in, Belchertown, um, is installed with equipment like that made from Intec in Colorado. In fact, information from Conservation Services Group in Westboro, Mass, shows that fully 94% of the materials incorporated into a weatherization project are made right here in the U.S. For, and this is a line straight from Steve Cole, and anybody who's heard this, I'm stealing it with his approval, okay? <laughs> Uh, furnaces are too large to ship, windows are too fragile, insulation is too bulky and cheap, and the caulk and other incidentals are made at U.S. chemical companies. So now we're done quoting Steve. Um, on a limited budget per job, these crews repair where they can and replace what they must so that when they leave, the residence is not only more energy efficient and comfortable, but it's healthier and safer too. You can see that most of the weatherization jobs can't be outsourced because weatherization the crews do the truly nasty, disgusting, dirty work 
of uh, improving some of the worst housing stock in the United States. I don't know how many of you would like to crawl under a crawl space or an, into an attic of, of some place that's been infested with rodents or anything like that. These people do that kind of thing. God bless, okay? I'm so glad they, they do. Uh, anyway, that's, that's an aside. That's not in here. Um, but it's true, they do. Uh, according to information gathered from WAP records, the work done by this program returns $1.80 for every dollar spent, and that's just the energy savings, okay? The other part of it is that the paychecks are plowed back into the local economy. As you said, tens of thousands, and that came right from her. I was supposed to say thousands, but she just said tens of thousands of people, approximately, according to Bob Adams, if you're here, and I got this from him, we're guessing about 25% of them veterans, um, are employed through every step of the weatherization process. According to the DOE, in the fourth quarter of 2011, the WAP network directly, this is just WAP, not the supply chain, directly created or retained approximately 10,000, I love this, approximately 10,513. <laughs> Very approximate, that's a general figure. All right, some would argue if weatherization, weatherizing your home results in such cost-effective savings, then the free market will ensure that it all gets done. It's great. Uh, and certainly, many of the companies here have both their low-income program and um, help folks that have more market rate, you know, middle or upper income. Um, but the people who can least afford it are, are folks that, you know, they, they can't afford to have this work done. They can't hire somebody to come in and take care of it, and they might be spending upwards of 15% of their income on their energy needs. So, the sad thing is, as our economy uh, pushes more people out of the middle class and into eligibility for these programs, we're seeing cuts to the programs in terms of the funding. So more people eligible, fewer, less money to go around. Um, from 2000 to 2010, the average national budget for the WAP, right around 220 million, if you average over the last five years, pre, pre ARA. The addition of $5 billion spread uh, of the ARA, part, you know, I should never try to read stuff because you are lost and then you're doomed. Anyway, the addition of $5 billion spread over three years of ARA along with new requirements for Davis-Bacon and historic preservation constituted an astonishing change for everyone. And we all know that partially due to some stumbles in the early days of ARA and partially due to serious issues in the greater economy, funding for 2011 was reduced to $174.8 million and then fiscal 2012, the federal budget was again slashed to 68 million, um, with 3 million of that staying in DC for training and technical assistance. So we're going from an average of about 220 million down to 68 million. As you would expect with such a reduction, the layoffs at weatherization agencies and their supporting companies have already begun. So the rest of this panel will cover some of those issues in greater detail. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, good morning. Uh, I'd like to tell you why the weatherization program is so important. While weatherization has definitely provided jobs, the weatherization program was originally conceived as a way to save energy. Many homes in the United States still have no insulation or inadequate insulation, and they waste energy. That is easily verified through the use of blower door testing with infrared scanning. While alternative energy is necessary for our future, it is still not fully developed, it is still expensive, and the necessary equipment is increasingly being manufactured abroad. Energy conservation through the weatherization program is available right now. It is relatively inexpensive. It is entirely local, and it can reduce the energy needs of a building to the point where alternative energy sources become economically viable. How the weatherization program works? <clears throat> Since their inception, weatherization programs have used cellulose as the insulation of choice. It has high R value, effective air blocking, uh, excellent fire retardancy, uh, has superb sound blocking. It has 84% recycled material, uh, a low embodied energy, low carbon footprint, and it is inexpensive. Through insulation and air sealing, the energy requirements of a building can be reduced by 50 per, as much as 50%. Um, and in fact, 
insulation with air sealing save more energy than all other energy saving measures combined. Local installers are trained and ready to work with the state weatherization programs. Inadequate insulation is removed, air sealing is done where necessary, and the cavities are dense packed with insulation to improve the R value and reduce air infiltration. Weatherized buildings use less air conditioning in the summer, less heat in the winter, and this saves money. How the weatherization program creates jobs. Cellulose insulation is typically made by small regional manufacturers. Due to the economics of the industry, low margins and expensive transportation. These jobs will not be outsourced overseas. The raw materials and the equipment are all available in the United States and the labor is all local. The insulation is installed by local contractors who purchase their materials and equipment from local distributors or the manufacturer. It is a stimulant to local economies to have the weatherization program be adequately funded one year where contracts are secured, crews are hired and trained, materials are ordered, and infrastructure is built, and then it's damaging and demoralizing to those same local economies when the weatherization program is dramatically cut back the next year where jobs are cut, local funding for training is wasted, material orders are canceled and the infrastructure collapses. These weatherization programs deserve to be consistently well funded. Why the weatherization program is good for our country? It reduces the amount of paper going to landfills. It stimulates the local economy through job growth. It reduces the demand for energy and increases our energy independence. It increases our national security by, spending, by sending less money to politically unstable regions. And it frees up money for discretionary spending by reducing the cost of energy. Thank you. My name is Ben Hernandez and I'm the Vice President of BMS Construction. And I want to thank you for being here at this great place, our White House. With me also is three of my grandchildren. They thank you too. <laughs> so I'm the Vice President. This is a company that's located in Dickinson, Texas. It's family run and operated. And I'm proud to say that they've asked me to share what's happened at the company level. After two years of working in the weatherization program as an HVAC contractor, BMS has tripled their line of credit with little or no debt. They've developed relationships with the state and local agencies performing weatherization across the state of Texas, across Southeast Texas. It's a great accomplishment for a small company like ours. <clears throat> a little work history on BMS. 2006 to 2010 was an emerging company with some growth, but not the growth that we experienced during 2010. At 2010, we were selected as a weatherization contractor by the neighborhood centers out of Houston. <clears throat> we saw 300% growth. We doubled our office space. We added 25 permanent or full-time employees and purchased many large items of American-made equipment and supplies. In 2011, and I think you'll hear this story again, we learned the process, we perfected it, and continued to grow. 2012, well, sales are down 75%, but BMS is contracting now as a weatherization contractor in an open market. We're still employing 14 full-time employees, and we got projected growth. As an example, we're still looking for employees now. We want to add some more technicians. Equipment we purchased, that was important to know, we purchased three box trucks. We purchased a large cargo trailer. We purchased one 14-passenger cargo, I mean, a passenger van to transport our, our teams on, on larger uh, scale jobs as far as carpooling. We had four service trucks and all of them Ford made and the uh, trailers were all American made. We're proud of that. <clears throat> this slide should show all the equipment that we purchased for our personal, for our, for our teams doing the work out in the field. 
As you can see, there's a lot of different equipment here, high-tech, laptops, desks, and so on. This, along with over 500,000 of supplies that we bought from local and national vendors, I think we stimulated the economy. It might be on a small scale, but we did it in our community. Weatherization technology and training. BMS bought and learned newly developed software to perform precise HVAC calculations and energy audit. That was an accomplishment on our part. And I'll share this in the industry. We got really good at this. A lot of our industry needs to follow, follow what we did. The Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs developed a weatherization training academy for all contractors and agencies performing weatherization. And they did it free of charge. They also developed the best practice for most of the work being done. Set the standard, train the contractors, and we follow the procedures. This also required for BMS to increase the training of its technicians to meet the newly developed standards by the state and the contract owners. Standards that were strictly enforced and monitored by the neighborhood center representatives. We learned the process, ladies and gentlemen, so did the other contractors in there. We learned it by standards, we did it we did it over and over by procedure, and I think that was a great accomplishment. Quality, it's the best. <clears throat> BMS joined the trade organizations like Air Conditioned Contractors of America to gain access to formal training and new standards of the industry. This was also an opportunity for us as a contractor to share the stories that we learned with the rest of the contractors, and this agency, this, this organization is nationwide. <clears throat> Because of weatherization, BMS has gained the knowledge and skill to effectively conduct business as a contractor, has raised the competency level of all our employees throughout the organization, has expanded the weatherization practice into homes that can pay for the services. I like this slide next, success stories. This is what really touched my heart. When uh, <clears throat> 2010, BMS contracted by the Neighborhood Centers out of Houston, and the centers were funded by the Texas Department of Housing, Community Affairs, <clears throat> BMS was on a team of contractors that worked on 6,000 homes in the Houston area. They saw an average of $80 a month reduction in their energy bill. This times 15 years, which is the life of the measures that we put in, is about $90 million. The government cost of this program, $30 million. I'd like to get that return on my bank account. <laughs> BMS is a growing company in the new energy and audit industry. Something we never thought we did, but we made that jump and we've become more successful. BMS more skilled has developed a process to provide a service for a growing demand of homeowners to save money by decreasing their energy usage. This is something when money gets tight, we talked about that. As homeowners, we look for opportunity to, to kind of bridge that gap. Each and every day, BMS employees educate their clients in sound energy efficient measures. Once the homeowner understands the value of the weatherization, the weatherization in the home, the homeowner has no problem contracting us out. It's a great opportunity. It's hard to see these slides change behind me. I hope I'm, a, I hope I'm on tune. You're good. You're good. In summary, BMS success owes it to the learnings we experienced while performing weatherization. Created jobs for those that have been out of work for an extended period of time. Many low-income residents of Harris County, that's in the Houston area, live in a more comfortable and energy efficient home for using less of our energy resources. The homes weatherized cost less to heat and cool, resulting in a decrease in the amounts of government pays when energy assistance is needed by low-income families. I don't know how to measure that, but I know that's an added savings because of the program. A new industry has developed. I think we've all talked about that. We are an example of that. New technology is available in America and is sought by contractors like BMS nationwide. We bought things from Massachusetts, we bought things from California, and we definitely try to get the best bang for the buck, but we've shared the wealth. There's a great opportunity for small and minority owned companies. Since the market is new and it has not been capitalized by any one company or organization. Ladies and gentlemen, this is truly an American dream in its finest form. I thank you for this opportunity.
And Rod, do you want to introduce who's up here with you? This is my daughter, uh, Janae Williams, uh, my right-hand person, and uh, the heir apparent to energy specialists and energy savers. <laughs> I'm uh, here to tell you, uh, or actually to take you back pre-ARA, uh, going back 35 years in weatherization. Uh, I started out with the municipality of Anchorage Hello? Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, I go back 35 years in weatherization. I um, was hired out of, um, in 1978 as a CETA employee with a new program called Weatherization, where the municipality of Anchorage had just received a $50,000 grant. Um, over the next five years, I uh, worked my way up from that to actually managing the program prior to starting Energy Specialists of Alaska in 1982. And since then, um, migrated to Washington and actually built this company up to the point where it's at today. We have uh, seven employees right now um, doing the um, ramp up period for the R program. We went up to about 15 employees full time and four part time employees. Energy, Energy Savers Inc. is based out of Washington and um, it has um, grown uh, tremendously over the past uh, seven or eight years. And uh, we are realizing that, uh, for me, I've always looked at weatherization more from the social aspect. Uh, I'm going into people's homes, I'm in their space, and we're actually having uh, the ability at that point to make a connection on a level, you know, even greater than what the impact of the energy savings are going to be. And sometimes I feel that aspect is missed when we're looking at the effects that we have in people's homes and in their lives. Uh, we're also um, are actually having the opportunity to affect a lot of um, young people. A lot of my staff that we have, these are people that are low-income individuals themselves, um, working with young people that um, didn't come out of uh, um, high school and go into college. These are people that basically came out with no idea of how life was going to um, present itself to them. And to be able to work with these individuals and help them mature and grow and, and for them and watching them to be able to take that same um, attitude that I'm instilling in them and, and the care that I'm taking to develop them and watching them use that uh, ability to be able to go in and work with people from that same caring attitude is just, um, it's been a phenomenal and amazing experience for me to watch and grow over the past 35 years. We have a lot of our pictures here. Some of our pictures, the, uh, the PowerPoint was put together by a friend of mine in Alaska. So uh, <laughs> these are some of the housing stock that we actually work in on in the, the northern part of our um, business. One of the um, and here we go again. One of the um, um, benefits of R for energy specialists and energy savers is that we have also been able to um, go in and build these um, these generational, I call this is our, our, our building generational community. This is where we've actually, um, this is my crew lead in, in a project that we did in Alaska last year and he call this lady his, his grandmother. He's, and she, we, every time we come in, she's making cookies and coffee and, and, and you know, just really telling us stories about her experiences growing up in, in rural Alaska. 
Um, now, getting back to what Aura has really done for my company, and what is, we've had an opportunity to branch outside of the single family for, yeah, for the, probably the first 30 years of my business, we only worked in low-income, single-family residences. Uh, and so over the past two years through the Aura program, We've been able to branch more into multifamily, some light commercial work. These are some of the buildings we've worked on here, some five stories, um, um, uh, low income housing projects, uh, tremendous results. I mean, we're proud of the energy savings that we've been able to generate, and yet at the same time, uh, developing techniques on a level that has allowed us to move from the single family or maybe what I'm uh, more so is expand into areas outside of the single family and to continue to promote and grow our business even though we're having these economic downturns and reduced fundings in the weatherization program. These are some of the projects that we worked on this year in uh, Cordova, Alaska here. Um, they, of course, everybody knows they got hit with, you know, um, unseasonably uh, high snowfall this year. Uh, we were able still to get inside some of these projects and do um, some very valuable weatherization work in those areas as well. Here's our crews with our one of our insulation trucks uh, blowing insulation into uh, air sealing and blowing insulation into the attic. We are also at this particular project um, did um, an underfloor uh, air sealing insulation package. Here one of our guys is doing, uh, this is a picture of a guy doing some air, actually the air sealing and the insulation part of this project. Yeah, I heard earlier about, you know, people really don't see the effects of what's actually happening on the, on the, on the ground floor, or we say where the rubber meets the road. You know, here's a guy crawling in a crawl space, and I had a crew, because the majority of our work is, is in attics and crawl spaces, and uh, I had a crew in a crawl space for six months. You know, I, I felt so bad for these guys, but that's where the work is. So. Um, um, and you know they they didn't you know they didn't they didn't cry about it. They realized the the nature of the work. And but we provide the the best safety equipment for my crews. We uh, make sure they have the, whatever tool they need to uh, be able to perform their tasks to the best of their ability. And, and try and I, we always attempt to make them as comfortable as we possibly can. You can see how happy this young man is. <laughs> okay. uh, you know, this guy, he loves to work. And, and the fact that this R program was able to give him a job and, and to assist him and his family in providing for their needs, you know, he is just, uh, he's appreciative beyond measure. And again, so for me, uh, I remember going out working on my first project. We had a $1,500 budget, and if you can imagine the $6,500 and what we're able to do with that, imagine going into somebody's house who's paying five or six dollars a gallon for fuel, and try to figure out how to make $1,500 make a difference. And now that we're at a point now in, in our growth as a nation and as individuals. We shouldn't be trying to limit our abilities because of um, the funding levels. We, we should be encouraged right now to actually raise this limit to create the, the most amount of savings that we possibly can because this is probably the last opportunity we're going to have to do this work. And this young girl here, she's, she's hoping that we're going to make the right decisions.
Well, thank you. I think um, we just heard some great stories uh, about the program, its national importance, um, what it's doing in the supply chain uh, with insulation, and really what it's doing on the field from two different, um, or two ends of our country. There's more than two, but uh, uh, Texas and uh, up in the Northwest. I'd like to open it up uh, now for questions um, from the audience. Um, are some My name is Tim Warfield, Morning. and um, I've been forced to ask the first question. <laughs> <laughs> I had talked to uh, Mr. Williams yesterday, and I'm, um, we want to thank all of the uh, business folks and the suppliers for being here. Uh, you're more than a, an important uh, part of this. I, I would be interested in what more you would have to say about the people who are being served, the low-income people who are being served by this program. I, I, um, I was low income. I was raised in one of the projects out of Southeast Houston. And uh, what I see today is I see the families really enjoying that home. An HVAC contractor going into the home, they would have never seen that before. Now the home is very comfortable. The humidity is down low, it's nice and cool, and the utility bill is lower, giving them an opportunity to buy some Christmas gifts. I mean, it's, it's, that, it's that simple. It's a great opportunity. Families are starting to look at that. And there's also a behavior change. I, I see a, maybe a behavior change where somebody's showing they care. And they, maybe they'll keep that home up better. They get a set of uh, filters every time that we leave. There's 12 of them. The agency uh, asks us to do that. So the maintenance that we didn't see before, hopefully we're going to be seeing it now. That's my story. Um, I don't believe anybody woke up one day and went, I want to be a low-income person. I mean, <laughs> life shows up, you know, and, and the, I remember working on a house um, a couple of years ago, and this uh, single lady um, was walking around in the middle of the day with a coat on and boots on in her house uh, because she was afraid to turn her thermostat up above uh, 58 degrees or 55 degrees because she didn't want uh, the u local utility company um, cutting her power off because she couldn't afford to make her payments. And I told her, I says, when we finish this work, we're going to reduce your fuel consumption by, I feel, a minimum based on what the readings were in her house, 35 to 40 percent. I says, at that point, you should be able to turn your thermostat at least up to 68 without increasing your current energy costs. And when we finished our project, it was still a challenge for her. She had gotten so used to walking around in her house in the middle of the winter, bundled up like she was going outside. And um, so, and for me too, initially when I started my business, for the first five years, I qualified for the weatherization program. You, you know, you just never know how this is, what life is going to throw your way. So, um, again, any opportunity that we can to um, make people more comfortable, uh, give them the opportunity to re-engage in life and in their life experience, um, you know, I feel it's, it's, it's our duty if we, uh, if we can assist. And I wanted to add that it's also healthier. We're working on a lot of people's homes that are elderly and, you know, have children with asthma. And once we go in and we air seal and we, you know, install the proper ventilation, it, it makes it healthier for these people as well as the, the combustion safety factor and adding carbon monoxide detectors and all that as well. Yeah, hi. Uh, First of all, I want to thank Ms. Hogan, Mr. Carson, and the White House for convening this session. This has really been good, and thank you all for the work you do. My name is Don Mathis. I'm with the Community Action Partnership. And I want to follow up a little bit on what, what Tim Warfield just said, as he usually anticipates all the good questions. But as, <laughs> as, as the President talks about growing and expanding the middle class, what strikes me is the young girl that I saw in the picture, maybe a Head Start kid, her home is now safer, and she's moving from a low-income family to maybe a more self-sufficient family by virtue of what you provide. The young adults that are being employed that maybe were unemployed in high school dropouts before, maybe now they have a job and they're moving from the low, lower class 
economically poor to describing middle classness. Can you talk a little bit more about some of the human faces and whether, you know, in the long term, especially some of you have been doing this for years, have seen a real elevation of the income level of the people you've served and how they have become uh, entering the middle class by virtue of the work you provide? Thanks. Well, I have a young man, actually he's not a young man, he's uh, probably about 50 now, but he's worked with for me for over 20 years off and on, and he bought his first house this year, and I didn't see that coming, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but here it was, he was, and, and now it's like he shows up to work, he says, you know, I, I got to work. I got I got bills to pay, you know? And it, it's just, you're talking about something that just really makes your heart feel full of joy. That was one of the most amazing, one of the most amazing experiences I've had in this program. Also, the program is very well monitored. And I said quality is very well emphasized by, by all our, our contract um, uh, owners, I guess. The people that we hire, we, ha we train them. We make them more employable next time. I don't see them being in the unemployment line anytime soon with the skills that they've learned. We have NATE certifi certification. We have EPA certification. If they ever leave our company, they'll have definitely some credentials to get another job. I think that's important. Out, out every time they talk to a resident, some of our residents are, are people that we go into homes. They don't see very many people too many times. They don't see that in the community. They don't see anybody outside the community because the neighborhoods that we service, they're really tight knit. Uh, they don't have the opportunity to go out. When they see our people come in there with their shirts and their trucks and stuff like that, hopefully we've been able to inspire and we show them the energy efficiency. And maybe they'll have some money to, to start buying more books and educate their kids. But I see their kids hanging around with our, our technicians. Our technicians are very uh, easy to show them the meters, the technology, the infrared gun. When we show them the technology going in the field, I think we're stimulating some interest in more higher education. Good morning. My name is Ashok Goswami. I'm from the Institute for Building Technology and Safety, a not-for-profit organization formed by League of Cities, National Association of Counties, ICMA, and uh, National Governors Association. I do know from personal experience that the weatherization program has done a lot of good, and these stories prove that. My point of coming here is that I still find a disconnect between the elected officials at the local levels to fully understand what this program has done. This meeting also, to some extent, seems to be talking to the choir. And I feel that the earlier comment which was made that we need to take this message to the small communities to let them see what the real examples are, the success stories will be a way forward and I see less of it than what needs to be done. I think that uh, the training which you are talking about, the impact, the quality which I think is ultimately a value is not a succinct message and, and it's not being transferred in my opinion that well to the elected official and to the local communities. And I believe that this is an important missing point. And being a link in that area, I can see that gap a lot more clearly. And I will urge that the benefits which have been obtained, the, uh, the observations which are reliable, and they prove that this program has worked well, is not that well publicized, and a little bit more effort needs to be done. Let, let's start with Annette on this yeah. one. I definitely want to take this one. Um, we totally agree with you. Um, that's, that's actually what AFTOA does, that, that very piece you're talking about, is how do we get the positive stories to the elected officials who get to vote on whether or not these programs get any money. We were on Capitol Hill yesterday. There's some folks that were there with us. Um, they're down at the end of the table. The Williams were there with us. And there's other folks out in the audience that are here today that will be in the second panel. Uh, absolutely, the people who make that decision need to hear these good stories. But I'm going to turn some of that back to everybody else who's sitting in the audience and anybody who's watching this live stream. If you think that this program is valuable, you have your own representatives. You should contact them and let them know that. They need to hear from you. If you're shy, 
contact us and we'll help you. We'd be happy to help you. If you want to come to DC and go talk to your representatives, well, heck, we'll go with you. We will walk you through these halls. They're confusing, no problem. But you can't say, gosh, somebody ought to get this story out and not stand up because you know that whole thing about, you know, I thought somebody ought to do something and then I looked around and realized I was the somebody, right? Um, so that's the one thing I want to say. And the other thing that I want to say is that um, they don't necessarily want to listen too much. Uh, so if you can uh, get a hold of your local press, uh, positive press and negative press, be, believe me, people who run for election, um, they respond to that, right? So uh, don't just talk to them in person, get the word out in your, in your local news well, where voters who uh, might decide not to reelect that person uh, will, will uh, have a little bit of a say. That if I may, I think this is a very good uh, suggestion that we should talk to our elected officials. Yes. But may I suggest that don't even uh, always look that the elected official is your congressman. Your council members, the local politicians, the League of Cities, their yes. associations, the National Association of Counties are stepping stone to make that message heard a little bit more loudly. And that's, that's a great suggestion. I can't do anything about that right here, but everybody else sitting out here can do that. Right. It's not just at the federal level. You are absolutely right. It's every local, county, state step in between. I think our organization will be very proud to be part of that equation because we are that great. great. Let's exchange cards. I will do that. <laughs> great. Okay. Thank you for your comment. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bob Scott from NASCASP, and uh, I've been in the program a long time, even though Rod has me beat by a year or two. I'm glad of that. <laughs> uh, and uh, Rod, I know you, I speak for you as well as myself and several others in the room. In that time span, we've seen a lot of changes in this program, a lot of evolution. Uh, technology changes all the time, but one thing that's remained very constant is one of the measures, uh, and in my mind, of a successful program is pumping insulation. And, and I'd like to direct this question to Chris. Uh, you, you really didn't mention the amount of cellulose that you produce and for the weatherization program. I'm, I'm just curious, in terms of pounds, in terms of bags, in terms of dollars, how much cellulose do you produce for weatherization? Well, um, it, it's hard to put an exact number on it, and it sort of goes up and down over the past few years, depending on, on the funding for the weatherization programs. But um, as an example, uh, when I bought this business 14 years ago, we were doing about a million dollars in sales, and we had 11 employees. And we have 32 employees today, and we're doing well over $10 million in sales, and that's uh, uh, about a million three, uh, 1.3 million bags of insulation. Um, I would say a very significant part of that uh, goes to the weatherization program. Um, uh, and there, there are a lot of people that are uh, fortunately uh, in the Northeast, the housing stock generally tends to be older uh, than the rest of the country. And a lot of that uh, housing is uh, multifamily housing. And so uh, with the programs that we have, uh, the weatherization programs, we're able to do uh, pretty significant uh, projects with it. But uh, um, uh, I, I, I can't give you a specific number as to exactly how much is, is going into the weatherization program, but, but a lot. Obviously, uh, we use cellulose insulation for retrofit which includes weatherization, and for new construction. I think we all know that over the past five years or so, new construction has not been uh, a key driver. Uh, so weatherization has definitely been an important factor. Kathleen, if I may, I think another thing that is important to know is not the amount of insulation that we put in, the amount of insulation that was not there from the beginning. That's right. I mean, that, that was, it echoes some of the 
some of the attics echo in there, and a three or four hundred dollar light bill is not uncommon because of no insulation and the ducts are, are leaking in this venting out in the attic. Have you experienced that, Ron? Yes. I mean, that, that is sad. That many houses, no insulation at all. Hi, my name is Al Cicchini. I'm the president of a software company called Libra. Um, hi. Uh, the, uh, I, I don't know if the question is for the panel, but maybe for other folks. Um, it seems that this should be uh, funding of this program, and the program itself should be a bipartisan issue and a bipartisan support. Um, the reason for that is uh, the homes are the recipient. They're the primary recipient. They span all types of people who come into the home, family after family, because the home persists. Okay? So that gives us second reason, savings. Energy savings, energy independence moving forward. Okay, over and over again. Third reason, um, if we accumulate it all together, they're all el eligible for tax credits, the carbon tax credit. You can achieve carbon tax credits by the continued savings. It reduces global warming, okay? Reduces those types of costs, uh, those types of effects. It has a health effect on the recipients, okay? So it affects our health program, the amount of money that we spend on it. It has so many different positives that come out of it that it should be supported strongly. It's a program that gives back money, right? If you spend $30 million, you save $90 million, that's a program that pays for itself. The other thing that seems to be slightly inconsistent is when you have seed capital like the ARA funds and you think about it as a business, the seed capital comes into a business in order to grow the infrastructure of the business and we heard how the companies are affected and can now become commercialized, okay? So it's, it's kind of a, it, it, it seems to be a business savvy investment on the part of the government, on part, part of the taxpayer that should be diminishing or not giving diminishing returns, but be giving more returns. So given all of these positive things in a positive program that benefits a lot of people, you know, not only those in need, but those into the future, that it's not a giveaway program, it's not a handout program, why is the funding being cut to be four arrow levels? Can I have the political questions? <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the short answer is that before ARA, the program really was almost invisible to most people. Um, if you've got a quite small program that's running about, you know, again, between 210 and 240 over the last number of years before our, uh, nobody really pays a whole lot of attention to it. And yes, some folks might say, we're going to zero it out, but other people come along and say, nah, it's just too good. Let them have their regular money, and then things just go on. If you dump $5 billion into a small network like that, um, you, you hit them then with Davis-Bacon and uh, historic preservation, and so then they slow down because you told them to stop. So it's really hard to get going when the federal government says don't do anything. Um, but then they get, they get berated in the press for not having produced when they've been told not to. Um, well, gee, uh, if, there, if, if there should be, I, I'm sure this isn't the story of our country, any uh, lack of bipartisan camaraderie, um, and, and you've had a program that's been supported by one side, and, uh, and the fact that it was supported by one side and entrusted with a chunk of money by one side, um, the other side can come along and no matter what the reasons are, um, can say, if you're going to support it, if you're going to say it's shovel ready, if you're going to say it's a good thing, we hate it, okay? And if, you, if you're going to look only for the bad stories, um, you will find some. Uh, the figures from the, the last audit that came through, and this is the federal audit, somebody please yell the name of that audit. Alice, what was the name of the audit? The IG? I, the IG audit, thank you, Brad. Um, the IG audit uh, found that one half of 1% of the ARA funds were misspent. That's pretty good. But you do, that does mean there are some stories that you can say, man, they sure screwed up right there. That's right. One half of 1%, they screwed up. But if that's what you put on every single newspaper and talk radio and TV show and say that is what weatherization is, 
then it's very easy to say, that we shouldn't give them any money. You know, these people, look how they screwed up, right? Look at this story. So um, that's a big part of it. It, be, it. it became politicized. It became the target that it, that it has been because the ARA money was so big that, that then they took notice. So the fact that it should be bar bipartisan because it works, and, and I'm, I'm not a, a liberal, conservative, whatever. I'm not Democrat or Republican. I'm one of those weirdo independents that swings all of the elections. Okay, that, that'd be me. So I think it should be part, bipartisan too. I mean, what a win-win. But the reality is they're going to fight with each other no matter what. And that's really sadly what the reason is. Yeah, and I just want to bring us around to why we're here today, right? We're here today because we can stand here today and talk about the great success of the That's weatherization right. program throughout the Recovery Act. Um, you know, I, I read a lot of the reports that came through the office, and I think one of the things that stood out report after report after report was the reason the IG was able to look at some of the issues is because first and foremost they were found by the people in the field, they were problems that were in the process of being corrected, uh, and, and they really were caught by the QAQC system in place. So again, there's not, necess not going to be zero incidences, but what it really showed was the system was working. Uh, and it really comes back to the stories we're hearing now now um, from this panel about all the good things that this program does do on the ground. And I think these are stories that do resonate regardless of political party. And it really brings us back to the challenge going forward of just getting these stories out in front of uh, the people that need to hear them. So thank you. Good morning. Last question. Use it well. I am. I'm actually, it's, it's less of a question. I just really want to commend the Weatherization Assistance Program and Bob Adams and you, uh, my fellow Baltimorean, uh, Deputy Secretary. But I think this, we cannot get away from the real economic value that was raised by the young man in front of me of the impact that you've had on health right. as well as creating jobs and creating better opportunities in communities. And I know that those of us who come from the healthy homes arena are really grateful for what we've done in weatherization assistance because extreme heat and extreme cold are big uh, ticket factors. And what we have saved in Medicaid and health insurance costs by you all doing the job the right way, which Bob has ensured, I think is, is an economic value that should be part of the argument on the Hill. We're going to help you make part of that argument. But I really want to commend the U.S. Department of Energy in this because they took great leadership on the Federal Interagency Workgroup on Healthy Housing and expanded the impact of weatherization assistance. So I was just here to add to the choir and wrap up uh, this line of comments. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we're going to move on to the, oh, it's a break, right? or next panel. Yep. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank One you. more round for the panel. Thank you. We are running just a little bit behind schedule, so we're going to take about a two, three minute break. Um, and at this time, I'd like to invite our next panel of panelists to come on up. Thank you again. Good job. Thank you.